let me get started here. Uh, I apologize in advance. This is a dense paper, perhaps over-egged, but it's a complicated story. Uh, we know the story of how the web came to be and how hypertext came to be. Uh, in our conventional tale, we begin with Vannevar Bush's popular science article, and then Engelbart and Nelson, or maybe Nelson and Engelbart, and some stuff, and then Tim Berners-Lee. This is a fine story, but it's not the only way to tell the tale. Uh, and when we're asked, why is the web as it is, and why does it have the capabilities and shortcomings it possesses, our inclination has been to seek answers mostly in the changing technological constraints of uh, network effects, Moore's law, maybe the sociology of the professoriate. Uh, and what I want to suggest is that the web is better understood as the product of two different responses to the disasters of war, a war that ran from 1914 to 1989, and that seems to have now returned. The crucial backdrop is the disaster of the short 20th century. It starts in a terrible war, a brutal worldwide depression and a continental ecological catastrophe, the rise of fascism, a war of terrible duration, the Holocaust, the gulag, the bomb, proxy wars and cold wars, the cultural revolution, espionage and sabotage, ecological devastation, and Chernobyl. The first hypertext conference, remember, was held just two years before the end of the Soviet Union. The web, I want to argue, is built on big ideas, ideas that responded to big events. A crucial fact is that for the Americas and a few other places, the war was over there. In Eurasia, it tended to be right outside the door. In the lands of war, the central problem and cause was seen as a failure of language and of reason. That is, the world was not as one would wish it. How did we get into this mess? So people like Kafka and Orwell and Hannah Arendt examined the perverse language of the totalitarian state. How could people be taught to resist the insanity and barbarism that had started and fueled the conflict? <coughs> this led very early to a tremendous interest in mechanisms that could write. Uh, we have Turing machines and systems of theorems and artificial languages all uh, ranging from Esperanto to regular expressions. Shannon tore information into entropic bits and Hamming glued them back together. Computer science rests on this work. And it's important to remember that all of this was undertaken really before it had any practical utility, much less that before there was any money in it. Uh, all of this also prompted a reconsideration first in many centuries of how reading and writing actually work on a realization that some things are hard to say and some things are unsayable and some things that are true cannot be proven. So these questions were especially pressing during and after the wars because texts seemed capable of doing infinite unlimited harm. The reader brings a ton of information to the text and does a lot of the work to make sense of it. In order to make sense of a simple text, you need a lot of knowledge and experience. Reading is not just a lossy transmission medium. A second understanding was the force that the collective discourse physically exerts on people, the impact of speech as a physical reality. And throughout, there is an intuition that there is a fundamental structure to things and that we could discover the structure. And this applies in argumentation, uh, especially in linguistics, in narrative, in history, in sociology. 
and that this structure might work more or less as a uh, structure had revealed all sorts of things in physics and especially chemistry that had been mysterious and weird for centuries. Uh, finally, it's important to recall the state of computing, which was a state of famine. Uh, I actually knew people who got graduate degrees, uh, uh, doctorates in computer science uh, who were deep into their graduate work before they ever actually used a computer. Uh, you could spend your career getting money for access to a few minutes of time on a machine that is less powerful than our refrigerators. Hmm. So how did this shape hypertext in the web? To begin, especially in the lands that had seen occupation, uh, there was an inclination to mistrust media and mediation. This shows up in a lot of ways, but one conspicuous example is the proliferation of regulatory pop-ups that force us to agree to a mysterious cookie ritual before we're allowed to read anything, and which we have to perform many times a day. Uh, another is a concern for referential integrity that pervades the early literature. Would links break? Would servers lie? Uh, notoriously, the Hypertext Conference turned down the paper submitted, which would have been the first publication of the World Wide Web, because it didn't pay sufficient attention to the threat of link breakage. In thinking about this dichotomy I'm advising, uh, the places where war was and the places where it was over there, it's important to remember that there are a lot of emigres and exiles, and emigres and exiles are complicated. So hypertext and the early web were really interested in structural maps and pattern languages. In the very early years, building maps of websites was a huge concern. Uh, more recently, we've done a tremendous amount of work on social graphs. Now, this structuralist intuition, it turns out, was almost certainly wrong. But in its wrongness, it's been and continues to be tremendously productive. But let's turn and look at the other strand of ideas on which the web rests, the one that starts over there. The surgeon in the center of this photo is my uncle Fred Shapiro. The war once over, lots of people wanted to go home and go back to normal. But what was normal? And what did you want to go back to? No one wanted to go back to the Great Depression still less the Holodomor. And there remained the problem of wars and the gradual discovery, which at first few people knew, of what had happened. One response, starting in philosophy, but soon in art and then in almost everywhere, was a new belief in personal action not just being good or making good, but in making choices. Once you'd been part of a community into which you were born, now the question was not personal salvation or the redemption of a nation, but to find the place where you really ought to be. And the influence of this quest for personal enlightenment is all over the rhetoric and the style of the early web. So is the do-it-yourself aesthetic uh, that was lifted from the Whole Earth Catalog and the West Coast rock scene. Another consequence is the web's early attitude towards privacy. There just had been no privacy in the foxholes and there wasn't much in the tenements. And early hypertext systems, including the web, were designed to shield against casual intrusion, the sort of thing you might expect from snoopy siblings or busybody neighbors. 
of the idea that state actors or criminal conglomerates would go after you seemed fanciful. And that's not the world in which we live, it turns out, not since Gamergate and Trump. Social media permit the modern villain to deploy traditional cruelties to terrific effect. Because the impact of villainous techniques is radically asymmetric, our feated plots are difficult and costly to foil. Another consequence is that the concern on personal expression and personal action led in turn to close scrutiny of fake experiences like Disneyland and to the web's enduring obsession with authenticity, which drove, for example, the enormous popularity of sites like Jenny Cam and still drives the famous Bear Cam. Finally, our fascination with transcending text stems from this movement. You can trace a direct path really from Ken Kesey's acid tests to the media overload of today's ad-filled web, uh, from Sibelius's experiments with music and synesthesia to the idea that a effective news site must of course present you with imagery and advanced typography and video that plays as soon as you arrive on the page. But now the night has come again to our circle studded sky. History did not end after all. The web lets us see and hear in a way people did not see or tried not to see in the wars of the last century. And this is new and this I think is important. Now, admittedly, <coughs> the web we have today lets us see exactly what it wants us to see. Uh, many of my friends think the web is Facebook. Maybe the more sophisticated think it's Facebook plus Twitter. Uh, the web sells us as a product. Uh, to the highest bidder. And if that bidder is a totalitarian state, so much the better, their credit is always good. And the research community is not entirely exempt from blame here. The web is our greatest achievement, but the web today is a feeded user hostile, polluted and corrupted mess. And much of our work has furthered the messification of the web. In particular, we've spent enormous amounts of research effort auto-detecting hate speech and pornography uh, without much reflection on other things that might be detected. And this is where I was going to end. And yet, two weeks ago tomorrow, the web let me get in touch with a pizza place in Kharkiv and let me send a couple of pizzas to some folks in a subway bomb shelter. I just got in touch and said, here's some money, take some pizzas for me to a bomb shelter. And I thought that was kind of a nice thing. And I told a couple of friends and I said, oh, can we do that? And so we passed the hat and sent a few more pizzas on Sunday. And J. Scott Johnson, a hypertext pioneer who was at Hypertext 87, built us an ugly little static site. <clears throat> We've sent, oh, I think 480 pizzas so far. It's not much, but it's not nothing. Uh, the real web is not much visited and there's not much money in it, but it still exists. So yeah, the paper's got 96 references from the history of rock and roll to microcosm and on to Vonnegut. Uh, it's mostly a vehicle for those 96 references. It's not a story of technological triumph, at least it isn't yet. Uh, that the web was built on big ideas and understanding those ideas might let us rebuild it. Thank you.